Welcome everyone, this is the crystal clear electronics video series. We present chapter 13 called DC motors in 3 videos. This chapter was written by Daniel Chopo and revised by Sabochvary. By the end of the videos you will understand the basics of direct current motors. You will know their structure and the main areas of application. Then you will be able to use them with confidence whenever you need them. Today's lead presenter is Ambrus Zelay. He worked at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering of the BME for 15 years and currently works on simulation methods at the Department of Vehicle Development of the Seychelles University of Győr. Thank you very much for your introduction. My partner will be Ben Sebárány, who is currently an electrical engineering student at BME. Let's get started. What have you brought with you? I've brought a lot of things today. The first thing I want to show you is a small speaker. Well, tech-savvy kids collect a lot of things that seem like a mess to parents, but they're actually very useful things. I've collected a lot of loudspeakers, and actually what makes this one relevant is that there's a magnet in the speaker, and there's a current carrying coil, and the current of the current carrying coil controls the movement of the speaker. So basically, the way it connects to today's topic is that we actually convert electricity into mechanical motion and that's what motors do. I see you brought a locomotive. Well, I could only bring things that were completely taken apart. Yes, this is another phenomenon of children with technical interests taking apart their toys. Each of these small locomotives has an electric motor and in small cars, small planes, small models, you can also find all kinds of small engines. Here we have one that is quite small, there is one bigger, and I think we have two of them now. We can also show it while rotating. Benza connected two volts of voltage to it. Yes, two volts, and you can see that as soon as we raise the voltage a little, now we are currently at 3.5 volts, the motor rotation becomes faster and faster. Of course, in the meantime, you can see that the current consumption also increases when you turn up the voltage. Of course, they are only engines from toys, and they're not the only ones we've brought with us. This is a more serious motor taken from a grass trimmer. You can see it in action. Later on, we'll understand what the internal parts of the main components are, and it's very important to note now that this internal structure hasn't changed much over many years since the invention of the DC motor. The basic design is the same, and it also follows that as long as you don't burn out the coil that's in it, you can fix a lot of things yourself if you understand how it works. That's right. Let's see how it works. Yes, let's start with electric motors, which provide the link between motion and electricity, basically based on the principle of magnetic effects. The operation of every electric motor is based on the interaction of two magnetic fields. This is the same effect which everyone has probably experienced by moving two magnets close together. If the magnetic poles are the same, the magnets repel each other, while different poles attract each other. Let's stop for a moment to clarify some basic definitions about magnetism. A magnet creates a magnetic field. This is its most basic property. I think a magnet is something that many of us collected as children. Where do magnets come from? Magnets are made by combining materials found in nature, known as permanent magnets. The other way is to create a magnetic field with electric coils and an iron core, which are then called electromagnets. In all cases, it is true that the magnetic field has two opposite poles, north and south. So, let's say, even if you break the red and blue painted magnets in the middle, you won't get the south pole and the north pole. Unfortunately, that's true. You can't create a magnetic monopole. The magnetic lines always go from the north pole to the south pole, as shown in the figure. This is, of course, invisible. Just like the magnetic field of our Earth, we cannot see other magnetic fields with the naked eye, we only know about their existence by observing their effects. Magnetic fields are represented with magnetic field lines, 
which are always closed curves, starting from a pole and closing on the other pole. We also call them fluxes, or in other words, flux lines. We can think of the strength of a magnetic field in terms of how strongly a compass orients itself in the north-south direction. In physics, the strength of a magnetic field is described by the quantity of magnetic induction, which has the SI unit of Tesla in remembrance of the great inventor and physicist of the 19th century, Nikola Tesla. Tesla lived and worked between 1856 and 1945. Some materials are not magnets, but they are affected by magnets. What about these? Thanks for your question. Everybody knows that certain materials are affected by our magnets, while on certain other materials, our magnets seem to have no effect whatsoever. In reality, magnetic fields affect every material, however the strength of the effect can be strong or even barely measurable. We call those materials that have strong reactions to magnetic fields ferromagnetic materials. The Latin word ferrum means iron, and it is not only iron that shows ferromagnetic properties, so we can call not only iron but also other materials ferromagnetic. We can imagine ferromagnetic materials as there are a lot of small elemental magnets inside them, which are arranged in the same direction when an external magnetic field is present. When the small magnets are oriented the same way, the material shows magnetic properties and has a magnetic field on its own. The so-called soft magnetic materials only show these properties while an external field is present, and they lose their magnetic characteristics when the field disappears, whereas the so-called hard magnetic materials, or permanent magnets, retain them even without external excitation. We call these permanent magnets. We learn a lot about magnets. Let's see how the concepts of magnetism and electricity are related. This is where inductivity comes in. Yes, at this point it is inevitable to talk a bit about inductivity. One of the important things to remember is that every current carrying wire creates a magnetic field, and the magnetic strength of this field changes with the changing current. Of course, a single conductor creates a very weak field around itself, so we need lots of wires. This is why coils are usually created with hundreds or even thousands of turns. The magnetic field will also be hundreds or thousands of times stronger in such a coil. Electricity, therefore, affects the magnetic field as a magnetic field is created around the conductor carrying electricity. The effect also works in reverse. That is, the magnetic field also affects the current flowing in the electric conductor. Can you talk about this? Yes, it is important to talk about this too. A change in the magnetic field induces a voltage in the conductor. This voltage, also known as electromotive force, creates a current in the conductor that creates a magnetic field. This created magnetic field always tries to weaken the effect that caused it. This is Lenz's law. Lenz's law is valid when the conductor forms a closed circuit. If, on the other hand, a coil is created, the effect is amplified, that is, a higher voltage is produced for the same magnetic field. This, of course, weakens the magnetic field that caused it. It follows from Lenz's law that the current in a coil or a circuit containing a coil cannot change instantaneously. The coil is said to resist rapid changes in the current. The resistance of the coil to current change is characterized by the coil's inductivity. So, if I increase the number of turns in the coil, the inductivity increases. Therefore, it is harder to change the current in the coil. In addition, increasing the number of turns causes the coil to create a stronger magnetic field. We use the letter L, after Heinrich Lenz, to mark inductivity. Its SI unit is H and stands for Henry. The higher the inductivity of a circuit, the harder it is to suddenly change the current flowing in the circuit. The inductivity of a coil is primarily defined by its geometric parameters, such as number of turns and characteristics of the material inside. By material properties, we mainly mean the material of the core. There are iron core and air core coils. Iron cores generally have a higher inductivity. Moreover, the inductivity can be adjusted by partially pulling out the iron core. So, it is necessary to define inductivity before discussing electric motors, since our motors contain coils and behave like inductive circuits. Yes, and before finishing the video, 
We will acquire one more theoretical knowledge so that we have everything we need to continue. So let's examine how a magnetic field is created in a small electric locomotive or small motors and what makes the rotating part spin. To do this, let's first recall Ampere's law. André Murray Ampere lived between 1775 and 1836 and was one of the first to investigate electricity and in particular its relationship to magnetic fields. Let's hear Ampere's law. Ampere's law states that when a current flows in the conductor, it creates a magnetic field around the conductor. We have already discussed this. Ampere's law also states that the strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the current. This is where Lorentz's law comes in. In the case where this current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field, a force will be generated in it that is proportional to the magnitude of the current and the external magnetic field. This relationship was discovered by the Dutch physicist Hendrik Anton Lorentz, so the Lorentz law, named after him, can be written as follows. The force, F, is equal to B times I times L, where B is the magnetic induction, I is the current, and L is the length of the conductor. In this form, the formula is true only if the conductor makes a perpendicular angle with the magnetic lines of force, also known as fluxes. The direction of the force can be determined with the use of the left hand rule, or Fleming's left hand rule, exactly, where our middle finger shows the direction of the current, our index finger shows the direction of the magnetic field, and our thumb shows the direction of the force exerted. Therefore, if we insert a current carrying wire in the direction shown in the diagram into a magnetic field in this direction, which is always represented by an arrow pointing from the north to the south pole, we obtain an upward force i.e. a force perpendicular to the, both the magnetic flux and the wire. To summarize then, we can say that a conductor in current creates a magnetic field, and if there is a magnetic field around the conductor, these two magnetic fields interact with each other. Exactly. You summed it up very well. These are the relationships that electric machines, or we could say, machines operating on the principle of electrodynamics use. These include electric motors and generators in conventional combustion cars or even dynamos on older bicycles. We don't use them much anymore. That is, because today's LED lamps consume hardly any energy, so even with a tiny battery they can run for quite a long time. However, in the past, LEDs were replaced by incandescent lamps. They consumed much more energy, so you had to produce energy permanently. Let's take a look at how such a dynamo works. If you rotate the dynamo, you can measure the voltage it generates with the multimeter. In this case, it is between 50 and 100 milliamps. Of course, a bicycle wheel spins faster, so you can achieve a higher voltage. With that, we thank you for your attention, and in the next video, we will review how to build a DC motor using the theoretical knowledge we have just heard. Most hallott elméleti ismeretek segítségével. Bye. Goodbye.